So if you have a Bible, I want you to join me in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're continuing our series. I've entitled the series Resilient. Uh, Just again to connect briefly the hoses a little bit. This is the most personal of all the letters that Paul wrote, and he's writing it to his his more than son in the ministry. The, The affection that Paul has for Timothy is extraordinary. And as you read the first timothy but particularly second timothy you you capture his heart and it's like every 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 sentence he's 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 wanting the best for timothy and paul is about ready to die and in fact this is probably his last many scholars believe this is his last will and testament um history tells us that he's going to be decapitated and uh he's in prison on trumped up charges and uh um, you know, for preaching the gospel and this kind of thing. And so he's writing Timothy. But as you read the letter, you know, the reason I call it, uh, title it one word, resilient, that's the, that's the feeling you get as you read this letter. That he's telling his young son, he's reaching out and grabbing him by the lapels and say, hey man, I don't just want you to make it. I, you need to thrive and you need to really press through and, and, and be, the, be, be the last dude standing. You can do this. So he's telling him to be resilient. And I think that there are seven key statements that Paul is making in this brief letter. And we're going to talk about the fourth of these statements. He's pushing Timothy. And he's telling Timothy here in in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, the statement that he's making here is, keep your perspective. Keep your perspective. Perspective. Now, I have to tell you, the word perspective is not used in this section. But as you read it, you, you can't help but think that he's, he's framing Timothy's thinking about three big things. Perspective on these three big things. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Perspective is very important, isn't it? You cannot survive or thrive in life without two things, transactionally speaking. Wisdom. And perspective. You become a fool. And by the way, wisdom and perspective are tied together. I don't know how you separate the two. Uh, They're two sides of the same coin. Uh, Wisdom gives you perspective and you don't have lasting perspective apart from wisdom. But there's a third piece too. I'm going to talk about perspective. You can't have wisdom or perspective apart from humility. Pride will make you stupid. Pride, pride will make you the biggest ignoramus in the world. But you can't really have perspective or wisdom apart from humility. Because to get either one of them is an expression or an admission of neediness. It's an admission of neediness that you need wisdom. You need perspective. But perspective is a gift. And the older I get, the more I value perspective. We've all been there. You're going through something. You're too close to it. You you, you think you have the right uh, uh, way of viewing this whole thing or this whole issue or experience. But you pick up a phone and you say, hey, look, Danny Taylor, I'm going through so and so and so and so and so and so. Here's where I am. How do you look at this? And sometimes it's just a different set of eyes. Uh, it, it it, It may not change what the content of the issue is but it can help you to see it from a different light and sometimes sometimes you're not nearly as frustrated because you've gotten perspective the word perspective comes from an old latin word and actually the word perspective means a way to see something Uh, and again it comes from this latin latin word which means to look through look through or to perceive I like the idea of looking through something to perceive. Perspective implies at least these three things. Number one, it implies getting a fuller picture of what you're dealing with. Getting a fuller picture, just standing back a little bit from it. Getting a fuller idea and perspective, (laughs) picture of what you are dealing with. And I've learned the hard way that I will waste a lot of time by acting too quickly. Sometimes, sometimes the most enduring decisions are those that you wait a beat and you get somebody to speak into it so you get the fuller picture of what's going on. Second implication is this. Perspective, uh, 
implies identifying what's most important and doesn't change. When, when, you, when you get perspective, perspective is not unrooted, it's not untethered. Uh, it's important for you to understand and for me to understand when you, you, you're fuzzy about something, you need to see the whole picture in something. And this, this doesn't sound relevant, but it is profoundly relevant. It is important to step back and say, okay, what are the principles that I need to guard and protect here? What are the truths that are always true that I need to make sure that I don't get untethered from as I look at this issue? So it is terribly important to know your convictions, your principles, and the truth. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that don't isolate your thinking. You, you, hear, you, you understand what I'm trying to say? Don't isolate your thinking. When you're in a, a fog and there's, you need to see things clearly, the problem with reacting is that you isolate your thinking, meaning you compartmentalize your thinking and you react to what's just in front of you without taking into account principles, truths, convictions that are always there. You will act excessively and you'll, 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 you'll overreact when you isolate your thinking. And what perspective does, it helps you not to do that, to respond rather than react. And I think the third implication of perspective of this word is that um, it helps us to choose a path forward in light of your current realities and unchanging principles. Okay, you, 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 you leave a conversation with uh, Danny. <laughs> You leave that conversation with Joe Vidal, or you leave that conversation, you go, yeah, man, they shared some stuff that I hadn't thought about. And more often than not, sometimes not, but more often than not, you begin to see a path forward, perspective. Now, I got to tell you, all that I just said kind of breaks down a little bit, okay? There's a problem with illustrations and, or, or explanations about words in the Bible, because what we're dealing with here in this text, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 19, uh, uh, yes, 14 through the end of the passage, what we're dealing here with here is um, God's perspective. Now, God's perspective is not, they're not suggestions. Uh, frankly, God's perspective doesn't have any other option or alternative. It is the only perspective. <laughs> So this is right. So Paul is writing with apostolic authority as he's giving Timothy perspective on these issues. And so these, 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 are, these are more directives, to be honest with you. They're concrete statements, but they also do relate to perspective. This is concretely how you ought to view these things. Now, in this text, going through the very end of the, of, of the chapter here, I think he's given him a perspective on three big issues things how to think and how to view three big issues the first one is you and your beliefs or i put truth there and so what he's saying to him there is focus on clarity the second one is you and your purity what he's saying there is focus on consistency we'll see what i mean you'll see what i mean by that when i get there and the third one is you and the issues, the issues. And he's telling him to focus on Christ-like character. He's saying Christ-like character and the issues, you know, you'll see the relevance of that later on. So he said, okay, you and your beliefs, truth, clarity. You and your purity, okay, that has to do with consistency. You and the issues, that has to do with Christ-like character. The very first one he says, okay, Timothy, you need, you need perspective. You're leading this church there at Ephesus. Uh, these folks want to clean your clock. They're throwing a whole lot of fuzzy stuff in your pathway. Uh, they, they, everybody got ideas. They got theological ideas. They got stuff that they think you ought to do. Everybody's got a narrative that you want to follow in all of this. You need to stand back and hear these three rock-solid things here that you need to be very clear about how to handle all of these things truth your personal holiness and the issues first of all he says you and your beliefs that's found in verses uh, 14 through 19 again the focus is on clarity listen to what he says verse 14 says remind them of these things 
and charge them before God. Remind them of these things. Now, I don't want to get too granular here, but the word remind here, uh, the verb is a present imperative. In other words, he's saying to Timothy, Timothy, keep reminding them of these things. Keep reminding them of these things. It's not a one and done thing. You got to keep reminding them of it. And I happen to believe in context, if you were here last week, when we talked about the, the third statement was pursue Christ. What he's talking about is, is the paragraph before. Keep reminding them of the primacy of Christ. Keep reminding them of the need to be faithful. Keep reminding them that they should not deny him. You got to keep going over it, keep going over it, keep going over it, keep going over it. A church should never stop preaching the gospel. Ever. Should never stop talking about the cross. Should never stop talking about the transforming power of the gospel. Should never get over that. Keep reminding them, keep reminding them, keep reminding them. Stay after it, Timothy, because that is the anchor. That is the anchor to true theology. It keeps people from going to the extremes and getting to be head case and, and jumping off the wagon and going down these rabbit holes. Keep reminding them. Keep reminding them. Then he uses this expression. This is a, you know, sometimes we, we read these expressions in the Bible and we think, well, this, that's just a throwaway line or he's being a tad bit profane or, or whatever. But he uses this expression. He says, remind them of these things. And he says, and charge them before God. That, that, that is a, a, you'll read this over in chapter four. That, that's Paul's way of saying, Timothy, Timothy, you are going to be held accountable to God for what, what I'm about ready to tell you. This is so core. This is so important to you. Don't you, don't, don't you ignore this. And so he's, he, he, he's not using the Lord's name in vain. He's playing the card of apostolic authority here. And buddy, you need to tell these people before God that they're responsible for this. And he gets into this whole truth narrative and belief narrative here. He says, listen, listen, listen. And charge them before God not to quarrel about words which does no good but only ruins the hearers. And I think what he's saying here, and this is, this is the backdrop of false teachers and other folks who have, who have made inroads into the church there at Ephesus and, and believers who have gotten a little mushy and squishy about theology and uh, assuming that, you know, just because they think the Bible says something, that that's really what it says. And, and then they're uh, kind of marketing and branding their own interpretations. I think what Paul is saying here is, look, don't fight over small points of interpretation. Don't go down that road. Don't quarrel about words. Don't let people suck you in. The stuff that, that doesn't make any difference, it, it's of no consequence. Um, 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 and, and don't get pulled into petty observations over minor subpoints in the Bible. Don't do that. He, he's not so much, at least right now, talking about false teaching as, as he is about... Taking secondary minor things that could be interpreted different ways and making them primary passions. He's really talking about the lack of proportion. And people have all kinds of hobby horses and all kinds of stuff that they want to, they, they want to, they, they want to make sure that, okay, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. I won't mention any names here, but when I first came here to the church, there was an individual, not here any longer, I don't think, uh, that had a particular doctrine. It's an, it was an important, it was a right doctrine, but he was disproportionately leveraging that and making it at the central focus of the Bible, which was not the central focus of the Bible. And I got to tell you, when truth that is taken out of proportion is made larger than it should be, it will lead you to error every time. And I think this is what he's talking about here. You know, some people are just nitpicky about certain things. They'll take a phrase and they'll ride that hobby horse. They'll take this and they'll make that the grandest thing that the Bible ever taught. And he said, and, and, and Paul said, Timothy, Timothy, <laughs> don't waste your emotional energy doing that. 
Because it's not profitable. In fact, that's what the verse says. He says, which, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Honestly, Timothy, this stuff is about the demonstration of pride. Sometimes people just want you to know how much they know about the Bible, and uh, which really they don't know that much about it. This just doesn't do any good. You got to focus on the main thing. It's not profitable because it damages people and it fuels pride. And then he contrasts. He says, okay, Timothy, here's what you need to do. The answer to these ancillary bunny trails that people want to march down and folks want to pull you into their little sidebar issues and some little arcane uh, theological insight that is neither insight nor theological. They want to pull you into all of that stuff. Here's, here's the way you respond. Verse 15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who has no need to be ashamed. Now, you, you might say, well, Crawford, I, I didn't think we had to prove ourselves. God. God accepts us for who we are. I mean, his, un- his love is unconditional. Do I have to work for his approval? Well, well um, let me put it this way. I think what the text is saying here, God does love us and accept us for who we are. You can't, you can't get God to love you more. And uh, once you said yes to Jesus Christ, you're, you belong to him. Uh, and that, that is all true. What he's talking about here, however, is faithfulness. He's talking about the stewardship of responsibility. And the faithful stewardship of responsibility brings the favor of God. That's what he means by that level of approval. He says, no, 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 Timothy, Timothy, don't, don't forget why you're there. Don't forget why you're there. Why, why are you there? Why are you there at the church at Ephesus? What does the church at Ephesus need? What is core and central to your ministry? Core and central to your ministry, however wonderful it may be, are not attractive programs. Core and central to your ministry is not something that will just, you know, keep your young people entertained. Core and central to your ministry is not just great music. Core and central to your ministry is not just transactional, wonderful things that we can do and, and, and have opportunities to serve. Now, I'm, and all of those things, all of them are very important. Don't get me wrong. And we think about all of that stuff. Don't get me wrong. But that's not core to the ministry. That's not core to what we're all about. That's not core to your Christianity. What's core? And he tells them what's core right here in the text. He says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. Notice the term worker. He uses the word intentionally. He says, no, no, Timothy, you got a job to do. You have a task to do. And here's your task. What will make you not ashamed? Here's your task. Here's what's core to a church. Rightly handling the word of truth. Rightly handling the word of truth. The expression rightly handling uh, uh, literally says uh, it means cutting a straight path. Now put that in context with, the, with, with what he just said up in verse 14. He's talking about proportionately in a balanced way handling the word of God. Making sure that you're faithful to it. And the cutting of the straight path has to do with the, with the idea of letting God's word interpret God's word. In the words of uh, 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 John Piper, the Bible is what he calls self-authenticating, meaning that the scripture itself is its ultimate commentary on what God has to say. And he says, Timothy, that's your job. Let me tell you something about worship here. We have, we have these wrong ideas about worship. Most people think worship was what we just did in singing the songs. That's part of it, but that's not central to the worship service. It is not central to the worship service. What's central to the worship service, and hear me, I, I, hear me out. What's central to the worship service is what's happening right now. The voice of God, the word of God is central to the worship service. The word of God is core and central to the Christian life. 
And so he says, Timothy, 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 here's your perspective on the truth. Here's your perspective on what you believe. Don't, don't get sucked in their bunny trails. What's the answer to that? Stand up, open the word of God, and cut a straight path right through it. Say what it says, not what you wanted to say. Don't use it as backdrop for what you want to do. Say what it says. Say what it says. Say what it says. I told you this last week, but one of the things I, I've uh, taught preaching through the years, and one of the things I tell, the, tell younger preachers all the time, is that God does not have a speech impediment. God does not have a speech impediment. God spoke, and what he said is clear. You serve what he says. Don't try to help God communicate. And so that's what Timothy was supposed to, was supposed to do. He wasn't supposed to pull any punches on this. He says in verse 16, but avoid irreverent babble. <laughs> Paul is quite the wordsmith, isn't he? I mean, avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. That's clear. What does he mean by irreverent babble, though? I, I think this, is, this probably refers to the empty babbling of false teachers. Their teaching is without substance. Is what he's saying, babble. It's without some, it, 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 it's like passing out sugar, sugar coated poisonous breath mints. Yeah, it's appealing to you. you. You like it. It tastes good initially. Doesn't require much of you. It tickles your ears. You're drawn to it, but there's no substance to it. Careful. Careful of the great bait and switch. He says, Timothy, Timothy, avoid irreverent babble. Don't even go there. Don't, don't, don't give it a platform. Don't, don't, don't entertain it. You know, don't introduce it. Don't waste a lot of emotional energy on these folks. Avoid it, buddy. Because you're going to get sucked into their vortex pulled on their turf, play the game according to their rules, and before you know it, you've neglected teaching the people, you've neglected pouring into their lives, you've neglected helping them to get to where they need to be. These people, they're, they're, motive, they're disingenuous, and all they want to do is, is slide in and manipulate and siphon off people and this kind of thing. Avoid all that stuff. Avoid all that stuff. And by the way, here he says it spreads like gangrene. Well, that's graphic. Their teaching is foul and rotten and it infects others. Watch it. And by the way, every church has, 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 goes through this. Every church. I don't know of a church that has it. I don't know of a church that Sometimes uh, folks who have less than noble reasons or agendas, they get attracted to a crowd, they get attracted to a church, and they begin to shop their, quote, gifts and insights and this kind of thing and want to weasel their way in. And Paul says, be careful, watch these people. No, don't, 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 don't engage them with that babble that wastes time. But you got to be careful because if they get inside of a church, you see, parasites need a host. A parasite can't survive without a host. And these, these folks are like parasites. They come in and they attach to something that is already good. And before you know it, you got infected. Paul uses two illustrations. Hymenaeus and Philetus. Now, we don't, we don't know who Philetus is. But boy, do we have a little bit of an idea as to who Hymenaeus is. Listen to these words. Paul wrote to Timothy about Hymenaeus in the first letter he wrote. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 20. And he set it up in verse 18. He says, this charge I entrust you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Wage the good warfare. 
holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. Now listen to this strong statement. Warning, warning, this ain't for the faint-hearted. He says, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Tell me that truth doesn't matter. Tell me that truth is not important. Now, I think, let me just explain this. I, I don't want to explain it away because uh, I think what Paul is saying here, although the text didn't say it, I, I, I believe that he interacted with them probably, discussed with them, tried to reason with them about their beliefs and the stuff that they were doing. But they were so bent on destruction. They were so bent on, on selling this blasphemous theology, whatever it was. When he says he turned them over to Satan, I think what he did is, says, okay, let's step back here. And why don't you go ahead and uh, let the one who gave you the content of this hellacious theology be your Lord. And see where it ends. Sometimes, church, this sounds terrible. Uh, I'm, I'm going to bounce this in my last point. But listen to me. It sounds terrible, okay? Uh, I don't want to get email on this, but this is reality. This is reality. There are some people that don't mean to change. Their minds have gotten so demented, so stuck, and that which is wrong and so committed to packaging it, exporting it, pouring it into the hearts and minds of people that they defy leadership, they, they defy authority, they will not respond to correction. At that point, you had to step out of the way, protect the flock, but let them go. I've done that here at this church. I've done it here. In fact, I said to one guy over lunch who wanted to export a hellacious theology. I mean, it was bad. Wouldn't listen to reason. And I told him, you're not going to teach that here. He said, oh, yes, I am. I said, no, you're not. You're not doing it. I did not, not from any... Because of my love for the flock. And that's our job. And Paul told Timothy, Amen. Amen. Don't, don't, don't let these folks take your lunch money, buddy. It's too important. So he was giving Timothy perspective. 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 You and the truth. Clarity. Second, he was given a perspective on you and your purity. That's verses 20 through 22. And here the focus is on consistency. Listen to what he says. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver... But also of wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master for the house, ready for every good work. I include verse 22 in this because it's connected. He says, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who, are, who call on the Lord from a pure heart. What, what, what Paul is using, he's using this illustration here of vessels in a household. He's talking about the difference between common everyday vessels, the clay vessels, and the expensive stuff that you only bring out on special occasion. Now to make it, you know, put it down on the bottom shelf here, I think what he's saying is that genuinely speaking, a person doesn't use fine china to feed their dogs. 
I mean, you're not going to break out the Waterford Crystal and the fine china to feed Fido, sit him up in the chair with a bib on. Not unless you're one of my children. I don't know how I feel, but uh, my daughter, Holly, sent me this. She lives in Michigan. She and her husband are physicians. They got this. They got three chill little, little kids. They got this dog, a beautiful dog, beautiful dog. Sent me this picture last night. Text me this picture. I mean, she was upset with it. Michigan, it snows, okay? She was upset because the dog wouldn't put his boots on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Never mind. I'm going to get let me on this. And so she sends me this picture. I, I, I should have bought it here. I, she sends me this picture. And she's got this beautiful stainless steel bowls for the dog. That's, that's cool. But what took me back is that she's got this plaque that's engraved with his name on it, Xavier. Now, what, what cracked me up is that the dog is kind of, the dog is looking at all of this as if to say, seriously? <laughs> Has nothing to do with the text, but it just reminded me of... Uh, but the point being here in this, this illustration, Paul is saying, hey, look, Timothy, it's not good enough for you to correct people with your mouth. You've got you've to you've compel them to the truth by your holiness. Did you hear what I just said? Did you hear what I just said? It's, it's not good enough for you to stand up and correct people with your mouth. You've got to compel them by your holiness. The, the veracity of your leadership and of your Christianity is not just spiritual gifts. Neither is it your experience. But the veracity and the, and, and the compelling authenticity about what you're doing, what gives, what gives holy credibility to what you're doing is your consistent growth in holiness. And purity. You see, Timothy, God wants to serve his meals on clean plates. And this is for all of us here. Thus he says, so Timothy, here, here's the deal, man. Here's the deal. You, 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 don't give them a stick to hit you upside the head with, buddy. You, you, flee. Run from youthful passions. But Paul is brilliant. Notice how he says, you can make a decision to run from youthful passions but not be able to get away from the addictions. How do you pursue holiness? This is what he says. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. I don't have time here, but listen to me. (laughs) This is amazing. What Paul is saying is that, look, you won't overcome your sin by focusing over on overcoming your sin. You won't do it. It won't happen. The way you overcome your sin is by focusing on becoming Christ-like. So he says, yeah, you flee from it, but this is what you do in its place. This is what, what do you pursue? What do you run after? You run after, you run after righteousness. You run out to faith. You run out to love. You run out to peace. Now get this. Get this. This is brilliant. He says, but you do this in the context of accountability and community. Where do you get that from? He says, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. That's what you do, Timothy. That's what you do. So. You and your beliefs, the truth, focus on clarity. You and your personal holiness, focus on consistency. Get after it. But thirdly, he says, Timothy, I've got a word of perspective about you and the issues. You and the issues. Focus on Christ-like character. You say to yourself, Crawford... Ah, how does the issues in Christ-like character, what's the relationship between the two? Well, look at the text. Look at the text. In verse uh, 23, 
Listen to these words. He says, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. Uh, Let me just say a word here. What Paul is saying is don't waste your time on issues and controversies that lack common sense. It's a little bit different from before, but don't waste your time. Hear me, church. Hear me, hear me, hear me. I've been in full-time Christian ministry since 1972. Hear me on this. The number of folks and leaders and Christians who get seduced into stupid stuff is alarming. If it lacks common sense, don't, don't, don't waste your time on that. Don't waste people's air on stupid stuff. And this is what he's saying to Timothy. Before you engage in a controversy, ask yourself this question. Does this make sense? There, there are issues in this church I don't get involved in. I've had people mad at me because I wouldn't get involved in their issue. And the reason I didn't get involved in their issue, oh boy, y'all going to fire me. Well, I'm leaving in a couple of months anyway. But uh, <laughs> the reason I didn't get involved in their issue was that it didn't make sense. It's stupid. You're going to ask me to take time away from other people who are sincere and hurting and they have needs and this kind of thing. Their hearts are right. And you're going to ask me to get involved in some little ancillary spitting contest issue that that is wrong to begin with. It doesn't make, doesn't make common sense. And so this is what he's telling, telling him. Don't, don't get in these silly quarrels and these little spitting contests with people or, or the stuff that does, it, it, it's just, they're, they're, they're entrenched in immaturity and the cement is hardening around them. They don't want to grow. They don't want to develop. And they just want to uh, uh, leech on you and take all your time. And there's no sincerity there. That's what he's talking about. Old boy said, I heard this old boy say a few weeks ago, common sense is a flower that doesn't grow in everybody's garden. <laughs> it's true. Some of this stuff is not all that spiritual. It just doesn't make sense. So he says, it's almost as Timmy, Timothy, why are you involved in that issue? Really? But then he says here, listen. Verse 24. Verse 24. Man, you talk about perspective. He says, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. Do you know what that word quarrelsome means? Literally, do you know what it means? That word quarrelsome literally means combative. Combative. Now hear me. You know what I'm about ready to say here. We know that Paul is not saying that Timothy should not correct that which is wrong. Because we just talked about that in the opening. Uh, yeah, you, you do confront that. You get rid of the gangrene and you go after. Yeah, but, 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 but he say must not be combative. That doesn't mean that you don't correct error. Doesn't mean that you don't speak against truth. Doesn't mean that you don't have direct strong opinions. But what what this verse means, what this expression means, is that you don't have an angry, fighting spirit. You don't approach issues from a gotcha mindset. Look at the text here. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. Notice the contrast. But kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. Uh, I, listen, I, listen, listen, I don't want you to miss this. I don't want you to miss this. Our posture is not to look for a fight or to attack people we disagree with. Did you hear what I said? Did you hear what I said? Listen to me. Don't, don't be borrowing from the, from the culture. 
this cancel culture nonsense. I, I, I can't tell you the number of times just this past year, I've been tempted to cancel my, my, my Twitter account, to shut it down, and even some of the stuff on Facebook because of the combative folks who are on there. And I, I just have to tell you, have to tell you, God knows this is the truth. And most of, most of my heartburn has come from Christians who are combative. What Paul is telling him is that, Timothy, your posture is not, not, not to look for a fight or to attack people you disagree with. It's wrong. And by the way, there's some people who just troll folks looking to, sh- to, to square off with them and to fight with them. That's wrong. And notice what he says here, what his posture should be. He's giving the qualities of Christ-likeness. Hear me on this. Hear me on this. No matter what you disagree with, no matter how strong you feel about your issues and have strong feelings about them, have strong convictions about them, it is never, ever, ever okay for a believer not to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. Ever. Ever. We do not have that prerogative. To be authentically Christian does not just mean that I may be right about the issues, but my heart, my approach must be right as well. And I'm sick and tired of people who, who, uh, other Christians beating up on people who make the statement I just made, calling us cowards. And as you approach the issues, yeah, have fire in your belly. Be clear about those issues. But you got to remember, you don't ever one off anything. To to be a follower of Jesus Christ means that I reflect his heart. I reflect his character. I reflect the fruit of the spirit. I don't go about setting people straight as if I'm kind of like scalping them and holding up a scalp. I won. And by the way, it takes more courage to be that kind of person. Yes, there is prophetic engagement. Yes, we should engage the issues. I have no problems picketing abortion clinics. I get problems with people being nasty with folks. And by the way, he says, patiently endure evil. As I studied the text this past week, this thing just convicted me. You know what that line means? To patiently endure evil, literally. A literal interpretation of the Greek construct there. Let me give it to you. Literally, it means able to bear evil treatment without resentment. Able to bear evil treatment without resentment. See, 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 see. We want the truth associated with Christ, but we don't want to exhibit the character that belongs to Christ. And part of our calling as believers is to experience what Jesus experienced, and that is suffering. But to be able to do it without resentment. So you want to take on the issues? Hey, some of us will be called to do that. Great. Pause for a moment. And ask yourself the question. Hear me. You got to listen closely to what I'm about to say here. Is my position on the issue the Lord of my life? Or is Jesus the Lord of my life as I address the issue? Which is more important? The Lordship of Christ is more important. Which dictates my demeanor. And so what's the goal here in all of this? Paul is telling Timothy, here's your goal, buddy. Here's your goal. And see, this takes the power of the Spirit of God. You can't do this in your own strength. 
No way in the world can you, will we be able to bear evil without resentment apart from the spirit of God? It can't be done. But that's the reason why Paul told him in verse 7, chapter 1. Remember what he said? For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power. Power? We can do it through the power of the spirit of God. Here's the goal. I want to uh, read these words, say a few words, and and end with a a little bit of a story here. The, the, The goal of all of this is, verse 25, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. Notice, notice how he says, how, who, who changes them? God changes them. God changes them. We don't change them. But what sets them up for change? My demeanor. My Christ-likeness. Not my insightful analysis and critique and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will so he's saying Timothy no you you address the issues Christians yeah address the issues but don't a la carte the issues Remember, as a follower of Christ, the life of Christ invades everything, everything, everything about us. Everything. And so my character has to eclipse the conversation. And our goal is that, hey... Crawford stood toe-to-toe with me. He doesn't like what I wrote. He doesn't like this thing. He doesn't like my position. But man, I never felt like he didn't care about me. Let me tell you this story. Before I came to the church in 2005, I spoke uh, fairly often and regularly to uh, the Atlanta Braves in their chapels. In fact, Karen, up until the pandemic, still, uh, she and Tanner Evans, uh, Terry Evans goes to our church. He's now the current chaplain of the, Fal- of, of the Falcons, of the, of the Braves. And Karen and Tanner still, up until the pandemic, had um, Bible study with the Braves' wives. So. Um, and so I had, a, I had the joy and privilege on any number of occasions of running into uh, Mr. Aaron, Hank Aaron. What a phenomenal man. Arguably, uh, well, he's arguably the top three baseball players of all time. Arguably. Unbelievable. Man. But believe it or not, his character was greater than his accomplishments. I say that not to give some flowery eulogy of the man. Well, let me tell you what happened. And I won't mention this name because uh, this, this other person's name because it's not very flattering. But for those of you who are Atlanta Braves fans, you will remember a number of years ago, a number of years ago, there was a relief pitcher who was a loose cannon. And uh, he popped off to a reporter and said some horrible, horrible, not even subtly racist things. Well, if you know Bobby Cox and the Braves front office and this kind of thing, you know, you you got the the image of Hank Aaron and all that he went through and all of this stuff. That was a PR nightmare. And they were in canon. But here's the rest of the story. Do you know why that young man's career was saved? You You know why? There are two people that saved his career. Both of them had gone through hellacious suffering. Both of these men had experienced unimaginable racism. It was Andy Young and Hank Aaron. When they found out about what he said, they met with him. And the young man apologized. And Aaron and Andy Young 
went to the top office, front office, and said, you can't let this young man go. Everyone deserves to be forgiven. What you have to understand is that Andy Young was beaten within an inch of his life in St. Augustine, Florida, during the Civil Rights Movement. Hank Aaron, you've heard the stories. There were, when he first broke in, there were, some, there were some cities that he played in that he couldn't undress in his own locker room with his players, his teammates. The letters that they sent that man, death threats, all of this stuff, unbelievable. And yet, neither one of those men, Aaron or Andy Young, have an ounce of bitterness inside of them. They could have, and rightfully so, said, yeah, Bobby, I listened to an interview uh, this past week, watched it, a video of uh, Andy Young being interviewed. And he said something that just brought tears in my eyes. It was so good. The person asking him, it actually was our own George Duffin that interviewed him, asked him about his feelings about justice. And it surprised me what he said. He said, the older I get, I'm not a justice kind of guy. The older I get, I'm a grace and mercy kind of guy. George later on told me in a phone call, after I called George, I said, man, that blew me away, just knowing all that. And he said, he said, well, let me tell you the rest of the story. And uh, George said to me that uh, uh, Mayor Young called him back and said, let me explain what I mean about justice. He said, what, what I should have said is that some people confuse justice or confuse revenge with justice. They say it's justice, but they just have a heart of revenge. See, as followers of the Lord Jesus, it's that demeanor of Andy Young, Hank Aaron, it's that demeanor that has lasting impact because you're not going about trying to win arguments. You want to change lives. Let's stand together. If you're not a follower of the Lord Jesus, what a savior, how much he loves us. He loves you. He loves me. And all we have to do is say, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin. And I receive you as my Savior and Lord. And he'll come into my heart and life. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, O oh God, for these clear statements. Uh, they're strong and straight from a man who's looking uh, toward walking into your presence when he wrote these words. Written to a young man that he loves so deeply. And desiring more than anything else that Timothy finish strong and that he focuses on the main thing. Lord, help us to do the same. God, help us to be clear about the truth. Help us, O oh God, to be consistent in our pursuit of holiness. Help us, Lord Jesus, to not allow anything we say and do to eclipse our desire to be Christ-like. Lord, lead in love through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.